Hey there, how's it going everybody? In this video, we're gonna be learning how to install Visual Studio Code and set up a Python development environment. We're also gonna go over the different features of this editor and see why it's so nice for Python development. So we'll cover how to easily switch between editors, how to debug applications, uh, how Git integration works, uh, look at unit testing capabilities, and a few other things. So I've had a ton of comments and requests to cover VS Code, and it just seems like so many people are switching over to it. Uh, I don't know how many of you all listen to Talk Python podcast with Michael Kennedy, but at the end of every show, Show, he always asks his guests what editor or IDE they prefer to use, and it used to be pretty mixed, but now I just feel like I hear VS Code so often on there that I figured I had to take some time out to try this. And I've got to say, so far, I'm really impressed with this editor. Now, I wouldn't doubt if you all see me using this from here on out in my videos. So with that said, let's go ahead and get started and see how to set this up, and I'll show you what I like so much about this. Now, I ran into some differences between how this works on Windows and Mac, so I decided to just make one video specifically for Windows and one specifically for Mac. So this video will be covering how to use VS Code on Windows, but if you're using a Mac, then I'll be sure to leave a link to that video in the description section below. So first of all, let's go ahead and install Visual Studio Code. So I've got their website uh, pulled open here in my browser, and that is at code.visualstudio.com. Now, Visual Studio Code is different from Visual Studio, which is a full-on IDE. Uh, VS Code is a lighter weight editor that can be extended with plugins for whatever we need. So be sure to search for Visual Studio Code and not just Visual Studio. Uh, I'll also have a link to this page in the description section below. Now, VS Code is free, so we don't need to buy anything. We just need to download it and install it. So I'm just gonna download it from their website here. So I'll click on download and then choose uh, your operating system. I'm on a Windows here. And now this should download automatically. Okay, so once that is downloaded, I'm just gonna run that executable. And this is just like any other software installation wizard. We'll have to accept some terms here, pick our install location, and I'll go ahead and create a desktop icon for this as well. And let's just continue on. And finally, I will install. And once that's installed, then I will open up Visual Studio Code. Okay, so now that that's finished, I'm just gonna check this here that says launch Visual Studio Code and finish that. And now it should launch VS Code for the first time here. So this might take a sec to pop up. Okay, so when we first run VS Code, it's going to open their Getting Started page in the browser, and also it's going to show us their welcome screen here within VS Code. Now, there's a lot of good information on both of these pages, uh, but we'll go over a lot of this in the video, so I'm just going to close these down here for now. So I'm gonna close the browser, and I'm also going to close uh, this welcome page here, and now, let me make this larger here so that we can see the editor. And I'm also going to zoom in so that we can see uh, the menus and the text a little bit easier here. Okay, so we can see right off the bat that we have a very simple design, which is definitely nice once you get used to it because you don't have a lot of other stuff getting in your way. But when you're new, it might be hard for you to remember your way around because we're mostly dealing with icons and not descriptions. So this bar over here on the left is called our act activity bar. And this is our main navigation for the editor. And if you hover over any one of these icons, then uh, after a second or two, it'll pop up with a description. So we can see here that this top one here is the Explorer. And if we click on that, then this is where we can open our directories and files. We don't have uh, anything open right now, uh, but we have the option to open a project folder. And we'll do that here in just a second. So the second option here, this is for search. So this is where we can do our finds and replace, and we can do these within multiple files. And the third icon here is the Git integration, which is the source control. And we're gonna take a look at this in a bit and see how to push some code up to GitHub, but I'm not gonna look at this quite yet. Uh, but we will take a look at this here in just a bit. Uh, now the next icon here is the debugging icon. Now, uh, this is a very nice feature in VS Code, and it's a feature that a lot of other editors don't have right out of the box. Now, I found the debugging pretty intuitive and easy, and we'll take a look th at, at this here in a bit as well when we debug some code, uh, some Python code. Okay, so the last icon down here at the bottom is one that we're going to be using right now, and this is for managing extensions. So whenever we click on this, let me make this a little wider, and it should show us some icons here. Okay, so right off the bat, 
it shows us some recommended extensions here at the top. And then it shows us some popular extensions right below this. Now, you might not have these recommended extensions. Uh, if you do, then they might not be the same ones. Uh, so, for example, this is recommending Azure repos to me, and it tells me that this is recommended because I have Git installed. Now, I'm not sure why. Usually it recommends uh, Sublime key mapping. Uh, let me search for that extension. If I search for Sublime and click on this, uh, then this is a Sublime Text key map and settings, which will import Sublime Text settings and key bindings into VS Code. Usually it recommends that to me whenever I, uh, since I already have Sublime Text installed. Uh, but if you're using another editor, then it might recommend uh, those key map uh, and setting imports for you uh, within the extensions here. But I'm just going to close that for now. And now we're going to look at the popular extensions here. So the extension that we're really after right now is this Python extension. And this is the most popular extension on VS Code by far. So if I sort the extensions by popularity, so right now, uh, if we go to show popular extensions, uh, then it's already sorted by install count, but we can also sort by rating and name if we wanted to as well. So we can see here at the top, we have Python, and this has 42.2 million downloads so far. Uh, and the one in second place only doesn't even have half of that. So this is definitely the most popular extension at the moment. And we can see in this description here of this extension that this extension uh, adds support for linting and debugging, uh, formatting our code, unit testing, uh, and IntelliSense. And IntelliSense is what shows us uh, what attributes and methods we can use while we're typing and give us information about those. And we'll see more about IntelliSense in just a bit as well. So I'm going to install this extension because this is what's going to allow us to work with Python code. And this might take a second to install because it's a larger extension, uh, but we can see that it just now finished up. Okay, so now I'm going to open some existing Python code that I have in a folder on my desktop. Now, if you don't have any uh, existing Python code to work with, then you can simply uh, create a project folder yourself and add an, uh, a script with a .py uh, extension and be sure that you include that .py extension so that VS Code knows that it's Python and gives you some nice syntax highlighting. But I've already got a script available, so I'm going to open this up. So I'm going to go to open folder and then this is on my desktop. So I'm going to go to desktop here and just open up my project. And now it's going to open those, open that up in a new window. Now I'm going to close down the welcome page again. And actually down here at the bottom, I'm going to select uh, deselect to show the welcome page on startup. And now I'm going to open up my Python script. Okay, so we get a few pop-ups down here. Uh, this one says that we can change our Python interpreter, and this one says that we don't have a linter installed. Now, I'm probably going to get these pop-ups a good bit, uh, but I'm just going to ignore them for now, and we will take a further look at these uh, whenever we actually do linting. Uh, but for now, I'm going to have to keep uh, just exiting those out. Okay, so I have a simple Python script open here. Now, first, I'm importing sys. Let me make this a bit larger again. Once we change some settings here in a bit, then it will uh, give us a better screen size here with our editor. Um, so first, within my Python script, I'm importing sys, and I'm printing out sys.version and sys.executable. So this will let me know what version of Python I'm using and where it's located on my computer. Then I'm just then I just have a simple function here that creates a greeting and then I'm printing out a couple of greetings here at the bottom. I just wanted some sample code so we could see uh, some of this syntax coloring here. Okay, so first, let me see how we can run this Python code. So by default, our Python extension is going to use the first Python interpreter that it finds on our system path. Now, if you don't have Python 3 installed, then this might use Python 2 if you have Python 2 installed. Um, if so, then I can show how to change these in just a bit. So first, let's just try to run this. So to do this, we can right click anywhere within our module, and then we can come down here to the bottom and we can see that we can uh, run current test, run Python, Python file in terminal. I'm going to select run Python file in terminal. And now this will bring up our terminal here and it will run our Python code. 
Now we're gonna look at how to use a keyboard shortcut to run code in just a bit. So if you don't like right, like right clicking to run your code, then don't worry, we'll see how to make it more simple in just a bit. But for now, if we look at my output down here, then we can see that I'm using Python 3.7 that it printed out right there. And then it prints out the location where that is here on my machine. And also it printed out those greetings. Okay, so what if we wanted to change our Python interpreter? So there are a couple of different ways that we can do this. So if we look at the blue bar at the bottom of the page, then in the bottom left, it shows us which Python interpreter we're currently using. So if we click on this, then we can change our Python interpreter. Uh, so if I wanted to use Python 2, then I have that installed here uh, in uh, Python 2.7 directory uh, with this Python executable. So if I click on that, and now I right click and go to run Python file in terminal, then now we can see that it's running Python 2.7 and that this is the location of the Python interpreter. And then it also prints out those greetings. Uh, so let me go ahead and clear out my terminal here. Now, if you ever wanna clear your screen and you have the CMD running, then I think you can just type in CLS. Yes, yeah, so that works. Okay, so now I'm gonna change this back to Python 3.7. We can see I also have Python 3.6 install here, and it's gonna find any of those, uh, anything that's uh, located in a regular Python path, uh, then it's going to find those. So I'm gonna switch back to Python 3.7 here. So let me make this a little smaller here so that we can see. Now, if you don't have Python 3 installed, then I definitely recommend using that. Uh, if you'd like to see how to install that on both Windows and Mac, then I do have a separate video uh, where I show how to do that for both operating systems. So I'll put a link to that video in the description section below if anyone needs to see how to install that. So I, show you, I also show you in that video how to get it in your path and everything. Uh, so once it's in your path, then VS Code should automatically pick that up and allow you to use that. Now, when I changed my interpreter, you may or may not have noticed that VS Code created a folder inside of my project directory here called .vscode. And that directory has a settings.json file. So these are settings for our uh, specific current workspace. So let me open this up and we can see that it set our Python path uh, within the settings.json file. Uh, but what if we wanted to use a certain Python interpreter by default for every project? Because right now, this is just this specific project's settings. Uh, so to do that, we're going to need to set it in our global user settings. And while we're talking about our user settings, let's also make some changes to other global uh, settings as well. So let's look at how to change our color theme, our file icons, and things like that so that we can personalize our editor a bit. So first, let's change our color themes. Uh, there are several built-in ones that we can use. And to change your color theme, then we can just open up our command palette. Now, uh, this is the first time that we've opened our command palette, but it is extremely useful. It basically allows us to access every command and everything that we can do within VS Code. So to open the command palette, we can do that with Control Shift P. So once we open this up, then we can basically type in anything we want to do, and it'll likely show us how to do that. So if I want to change color themes, and I'll type in color here, and I can just change my color theme press. Uh, preferences by clicking on this right here. So whenever I click on this, if we scroll up and down in this list, then we can see that it gives us a live preview of exactly what this looks like. Now they have some nice built-in uh, themes here, uh, but I'm actually going to install additional color themes, and that's the last option down here at the bottom. So I'm going to click on that, now, if anyone has watched my videos before, then you know that I usually use Sublime Text, and the color theme that I use in Sublime Text is called Predon. Now, somebody has actually put together a Predon for VS Code as well, and I'm glad that they did because I like that color theme. So that's what I'm going to use. And it's this one here, Predon Theme Kit. Uh, this Predon Twilight, I'm not sure what that is, but this is the one that looks like the Sublime Text version. So I'm going to install that, and then click on that to use Predon. Now, if I go back to my script, then we can see, uh, for those of you who have seen my videos before, this likely looks more uh, how I usually have it set up. And there are plenty other popular colored themes out there. So definitely look around and see what you like. Uh, because, you know, as programmers, we are using our editors a lot. So you should definitely have something that is pleasant to your specific taste. 
Now we can also change how our file icons look over here in the sidebar. Uh, so to do that, we can see that this looks pretty good right now. It gives us a Python icon for the Python files and these brackets for a JSON file. But if we wanted to update this, then we can open our command palette. And now I'm going to type in file icon, and then we can change our file icon theme. So if I click on that, then by default, we only have a couple in here. But again, we can install additional file icon themes. And here, uh, if we want to sort by popularity, then again, we can just click on these extra drop downs here and then go down to sort by install count. And it looks like it probably was already sorted by install count. So the one that I personally like is this one here called AYU. So I'm going to click on that and I'm going to install that. And once that installs, it might actually override your color theme here. I'm going to select pre-dawn again down there at the bottom. Uh, but now if we go back to our editor and let me open up the command palette again and press file icon theme, then we can select AYU since that was installed. And when I select that, we can see that now these changed icons over here. And I like this one because it gives a nice indicator of uh, closed and open folders here on uh, within your file explorer over here. Okay, so I think those setting changes look pretty good for both our color theme and for our file icons. So right now, we're actually implicitly changing our global user settings by changing our color themes and all of that. But there are a ton of other settings that we can change that we haven't seen yet. So if we wanna see all of the settings that we can change, then we can open our settings by going to the bottom left of our activity bar and clicking on this gear icon here. Uh, so if I click on that, then we can see that we have some other uh, options here as well. We can open our command palette from there. We can look at our settings, our extensions, keyboard shortcuts, all of that. I am going to open up the settings for now. Okay, so they used to have this set up to where it opened up the default settings and your user settings side by side in JSON format. And I kind of like that a bit better. But now we have it to where it opens up this uh, UI version of our settings instead. So you can come in here and change your settings uh, using this user interface. But honestly, I hardly ever use it like this. Uh, I am coming from Sublime Text, so I'm much more used to the JSON settings. And I believe that it gives you a better overview of the settings that you're changing. Now we can switch to the JSON version of our settings uh, just by clicking on these brackets up here. And when we hover over that, it says open settings in JSON. So I'm gonna click on that. And now these are our settings in JSON format. So we can see that I view, have zoomed into our editor. So we have a zoom level of three. And anytime we hover over a setting, we can see that it gives us a description of what that setting does as well. So that is a nice feature. Now, since these are our user settings, this is only gonna show us what the settings that we have changed from the defaults. So I have changed the zoom level. Uh, this startup editor is because I said that I don't wanna see the uh, welcome screen when I log in. We have the color theme here and the icon theme here as well. Now, I have some other preferred settings that I'll show in just a bit. Um, now, I do wish that they showed the default settings by default when we open up our settings as well, uh, because I feel like someone who's new to VS Code might not know what settings they can and can't change. Uh, so it'd be nice to see those default settings. So I'm gonna change my settings so that it does show my user settings and default settings. Now, I usually have this set up to where it shows them side by side, but since I'm so zoomed in here, side by side isn't really going to look good in this video. Uh, so I'm just gonna leave that part out for now. So uh, to do this, I'm going to open my command palette and now I'm gonna type in default settings. And when I type in default settings, we can see here it says open default settings. So I'm going to open those and these default settings here, these are all of the settings that we can change within VS Code. So we can see that there are a ton here and the comments here uh, show us an or show us a, a snippet of what cha the changing these settings would actually do. Now, like I said, I'm gonna change a couple of settings here that open up my settings in JSON since I prefer that to the UI version. And also I'm going to have it open up my default settings when I open up my user settings. So to do this, you don't really have to know what I'm doing here, uh, but I'm just gonna do a search. And you could find these on your own, but I've already written them down here. So this is within 
workbench.settings. And we can see here that we have a few settings here. So we have workbench.settings.editor. It's currently set to UI by default. I'm gonna copy that and go into my user settings. And instead, I'm gonna change this to JSON. Now, if we don't know what options we can use with this setting, then we can always click on this pencil icon over here in the uh, gutter that says edit. When I click on that, it gives us the options that we can use. So we can either use UI or JSON. So that is a nice touch there. And it says I have to save and retry in order to save that. So I changed that to JSON. Now I'm also going to, uh, let's see, come down here a little bit and I want open default settings set to true as well. We can see that the comment here says controls whether opening settings also opens uh, an editor showing all the default settings. And I like to see my default settings while I'm editing my user settings. So I will set that to true. And now we have that saved. So now if I save that and then I close down all of my settings here, if I reopen the settings by doing the, the same way, going to the activity bar here, clicking on this gear icon and clicking on settings, then now it opens up my settings and default settings here at the same time. And just to get that into one single window, I can just drag and drop it over there. So now we have our default settings here and we have our user settings here. So now anytime you wanna see what default settings you can change, then you can just come in here and look at all of the comments, or if you wanna search for something specifically like Python, then I can do a control F over here to find. And then let's say that I wanted to search for Python settings. So I can do Python dot, and now this will take me to the Python settings. So for example, like I was saying before, one setting that I wanna change is my default Python path so that it runs the exact version of Python that I wanted to run by default anytime we start a new project. So I could just do that by searching Python dot, and then I'm gonna try to do Python path. So Python dot P, let's search through here. So we can see here that we have a pip env path, poetry path, and here we have Python path. So now in order to change this, I'm just going to copy this and put it here uh, into my settings. And now I want to put the full path uh, to the version of Python that I wanna use by default. So in order to do this, I think the best way to grab this would just be to open my integrated terminal here. And you can do that with control tilde. And now I'm gonna do a command of where Python. And this should show me, uh, okay, so that didn't work there. Let me see if the Python command is running there. Okay, so that is. So I can do import sys and then do sys dot uh, executable and that will give me the full Python path there. Now that is the version that I wanna use for every default project. I wanna use this Python 3.7. So I can exit out of there and clear the screen. And now I'm just going to paste that uh, here within my settings. And we can take those single quotes out that it added in for us because that'll just mess it up. Okay, so now I can save that. So now anytime we're working with a Python file, then we shouldn't need to check which Python interpreter we're using because you should know by default uh, which one it's going to be using. Now, while we're in our settings here, we can also make some other changes to our editor that you might like. Now I'm gonna copy and paste a few settings into mine here. Uh, now you don't have to do this, but these are just personal preferences and it'll also uh, make the text a, a little and window here a little bit easier for you to see during this video. So let me grab these and I'll explain exactly what I changed. So these are the settings that I want to change here. So I'm going to copy these and just paste them in uh, to my user settings here. So if I save that, then we can see that the text is way too large uh, because I am currently zoomed in too far here. Um, so let me zoom, actually I'll keep the zoom the same, uh, but I will change the font size here. So let me try, let's see if, okay, so I think size 14 font. Well, actually that's a little small. Let's do 
let's do 16 font for this video. Now, that might look a lot larger than size 16 font, uh, but that is because we are uh, zoomed in to the window here. So that size 16 font actually looks pretty large. Uh, the reason we're zoomed in is so that we can see everything else here in the editor, like the sidebar and things like that. Uh, now, on your machine, you might not need to zoom in. The only reason I'm doing that is because I'm recording this video and I want everybody uh, to be able to see. Uh, now, I'm also using uh, Source Code Pro here as my font for the editor and for the uh, debug terminal. Uh, now, if you want to use that as well, then that's a font that you can download from Google Fonts. And I'll be sure to leave a link to that in the description section below as well. So, like I said, those are just personal preferences. Uh, the important thing here was setting the default Python interpreter. So now VS Code should use that version of Python uh, by default unless we change our interpreter specifically for our project. Now, why would we want to change our interpreter specifically for one project? Well, the most common reason is because it's usually a good idea to create a virtual environment for our project. So let's see how we'd create a virtual environment and then set that as our interpreter for a specific project. So I'll create one uh, for the current project that we currently have open here. So to do this, I think it's easiest to do this through the integrated terminal. So I'm gonna open that up. And again, that is control tilde. And whenever you open up a terminal, it's automatically going to open up into your current uh, project folder. So we can see here that I'm on my desktop in this my project folder. So now that we're navigated to our project directory, this is where I'm going to create the virtual environment. So if you want to create a new virtual environment, I think the easiest way to do that is using the VENV module from the standard library. And if you don't know how to create virtual environments using VENV, then I do have a separate video that goes into more detail about how to do this. So I'll be sure to leave a link to that in the description section below as well, if anyone is interested. But basically we can just say Python, whoops, let me spell that right, Python dash M, and that will run a module and the module we want to run is V E and V. And now we can pass in our arguments to that module and the arguments that we want are the virtual environment name and the virtual environment name. I'm just going to call V E and V as well. So if I run that, then it might take a second to create that virtual environment. Uh, but once that finishes, then let me check my project directory up here now. And yeah, we have a VENV directory here. So that virtual environment did get created. So let me close down my terminal here. And now that we have that for our project, we just need to change the interpreter like we did before. So I can come down here to the bottom left and click here. And when I do that, we can see that we have a Python 3.7 uh, in called VENV here, and we can see that it gives the location of the current directory within this VENV folder. So VS Code automatically picked that up. So I'm gonna to change to that. And like I was saying, VS Code automatically picked that up. And that's because VS Code automatically picks up virtual environments within the base of our project, uh, how, like how we created it here. Now it can also pick up Conda environments as well and things like that. Now, if you're using a virtual environment that's located somewhere else on your machine, uh, then to do that, you can just open up the settings.json file here in your .vs code directory. And we can just put uh, the path to whatever uh, virtual environment you want to use within here. But it can auto, t auto detect a lot of those for us. But if you have it, you know, like on your desktop or something like that, or in a virtual environments directory, then you can just hard code that path in here to use that for a specific project. Now, when you have a virtual environment activated, it will actually activate that environment in all new terminal sessions as well. Uh, so uh, I think that's a really nice feature. So if I open up terminal here, let me close down the one I currently have by clicking this trash can and kill terminal. Let me open up another one. And when I open that, we can see that it automatically came in and ran that activate uh, script on that virtual environment. So if I clear my screen here, we can tell that the virtual environment is active uh, because we have VNV over here in parentheses. So if we wanted to install some packages within this virtual environment, then we should just be able to do it with our pip command. So if I say pip install request to install the request package or the request library, then I will let this install. 
And once this is installed, then we should be able to just import this into our scripts with no problem. So I'm going to close down my terminal there. And within my script, I'm just going to say import request. And I'll make sure this is working by, whoops, uh, oh, there we go. And I will make sure that this is working by coming down here towards uh, the bottom of this script. And I'm just going to remove these current print statements that I have now. And I'm going to replace these with a request. So uh, now also as I'm typing here, uh, watch how the IntelliSense works. Uh, and this is built in the VS code and it's going to show us the attributes and methods that we can use for different objects. So if I say R is equal to request dot, and whenever I press dot, uh, then it will pop up with all of the things that I can do with requests. So we can see that we can use the get method. Uh, we can use the post method, uh, session, all kinds of things like that. So if let's say that I want to use Git, so I'll click on Git, it'll autofill that. Now, if I want to know more information about this, I can right click on Git and we can see that we have, you know, go to definition, peak definition. If I click on go to definition, then this is actually took me to that Git method within the request library itself. So we can see exactly how that method was written. So I think that's a very nice feature. Now, if we don't want to completely open up that file where that method exists, then we can click on peak definition and that will just show us a, a little peak here. So we can see uh, the get method here within this little window. But when we close that, we're right back to our file. Uh, so I think that that IntelliSense is very useful for giving you information like that. So let me actually go uh, to my URL here. So I'm going to uh, just type in um, that I want to oh, get the URL for, I'm just going to go to my personal website. So HTTPS uh, colon forward slash forward slash coreyms.com. And now I'm going to print out uh, the status code that I get back from that. So I'll do an R dot status code. And now let me save that. And now let me run this code. Uh, first, let me un or comment out the sys.version there because I don't want a whole lot of output. But now I can run this code by right clicking and selecting run Python file in terminal. So I will run that and it's gonna open up, activate our environment and then print this out. So we can see here that the executable that it used, this is it right here, that is our virtual environment. So it is using that virtual environment that we just created uh, and get a 200 response there from the website. So that's good. Okay, so now let's take a look at how we can auto format our Python code. Uh, so right now we don't currently have a formatter installed. So now we're gonna start taking care of some of these pop-ups that we've been seeing throughout the video. Uh, so. I'm now I'm actually going to listen to one of those pop-ups and use uh, and install a formatter. So to format our code, we can use a keyboard shortcut. Uh, I kind of forget what that shortcut is. So I'm just going to use my command palette and type in format. And we can see here that it is shift alt F. So I'm going to use shift alt F to format my code. When I do that, it pops up here and it says, uh, hey, you don't have auto pep eight installed. Uh, would you like to install that as your formatter? Uh, and it also suggests some other popular formatters here too, uh, such as black and YAPF. Uh, now I'm going to use black here, but you can use auto pep eight if you'd like. Uh, I actually don't really know the differences between those two, but I saw uh, on Kenneth Wright's blog that he was using black. So I'm going to give it a shot and see if I notice any differences or not. Um, okay, so now with that formatter installed, uh, then we should be able to format our code just by using that shift alt F keyboard shortcut. And now it formatted our code. Now that might not look a lot different uh, because our code was already pretty well formatted to begin with, but let me just really make this look ugly. So let's say you had some ugly code written here, uh, and then I'll save that. Now, if we want to auto format this code, then I can just press shift alt F like we saw before. And now it formats our code to split that out nicely. 
Now, sometimes while we're making uh, changes like this, it might only make those changes in our workplace settings and not in our global user settings. Uh, so I'm gonna open up my project settings here within that .vs code directory. And we can see here that it set our formatter to black. Now I'm just going to copy that and put that into my actual user settings uh, so that uh, it uses that by default. So I'm going to come down here to the, actually I'll just go below my Python path and I will paste in that formatter. And also while I'm here in my global settings, I'm also gonna change my settings so that my code formats automatically anytime I save my file. Uh, so I could search for uh, the settings I need to change, um, but let me show you a nice tip that I use a lot while changing settings. So if I come down here and I start typing, if I press control space, then it's gonna show us all the options that we have as we type. So if I say editor dot and keep typing here, uh, so I typed out editor dot form, then it's gonna show me all of uh, these here. So format on paste, format on save. I want format on save. So anytime I save, uh, it'll just auto format my code for me. And that's a setting that I think is very useful so that we don't have to keep manually doing that. And the auto formatting in VS Code really is great. Not only does uh, it do Python like we have set up here, uh, but it will also auto format uh, for JSON and other languages as well. And those are all things that usually require additional packages with editors like Sublime Text. And sometimes those can be hard to get set up properly. So it's nice that a lot of this stuff just simply works within VS Code. Now this isn't part of the formatter, but we can actually use VS Code to sort our imports also. So let me add a couple of imports here uh, so that we can see what this looks like. So underneath requests, I'm gonna also import OS, and I'm gonna also import math. And now, uh, if I open my command palette and I search for sort imports, spell that correctly, uh, if I click on that, then it should sort those out. Okay, so uh, we can see that it put these in alphabetical order. And I think that it dropped request down a line here because it wants to separate out requests since it's a third party package. So it probably has all those third party packages separate from the standard library modules. And if you have any imports that are from imports, then it'll put those closer to the bottom just because it's the standard. So if instead from OS, I was to say from OS import rename, and then I did a sort installs or sort imports, I'm sorry, sort imports on that, then it should move that uh, from import down to the bottom there. So just like it did, so that's good. Okay, so now let's also get code linting enabled. Uh, so we can see the uh, pop-up down here that it keeps telling me that I should be using this. So linting will look at our code and tell us if it thinks that something is off. And it's nice to have this because it can keep you from making mistakes that you might not notice on your own. So if this pop-up wasn't open here, I'm just gonna close it one more time, uh, then we can search using our command palette. I'm just going to type in linting. And now I'm gonna choose run linting. When I try to run linting, it's going to pop up with that pop-up. So now I'm going to install that and it'll install PyLint. And you can use other linters as well, but I think that PyLint is a, a nice default uh, linter to use. I haven't really tried any of the other ones, but PyLint has been good for me. Okay, so once PyLint is finished installing there, now let me put something in that will trigger a linting error and a warning. So uh, let me comment, uncomment out here where I am printing out sys.version. And instead, let me uh, use Python 2 syntax here for this print statement. So if I uh, save that, then we can see that after a second here, I get a red underline. And if I hover over that, I'm zoomed in a little far, but we can see if we look at the bottom there, it says missing parentheses in call to print. Did you mean print uh, with the parentheses? Now, if that's too hard to read there uh, because we're zoomed in so far, uh, we can also click down here uh, in the bottom left, right beside our interpreter, and we can see that there are errors and warnings. So this is marked as an error. If I click on that, then we can see that it lists out the problems for us here. So here we have one problem in our script and it says missing uh, parentheses and call to print. So then that will uh, 
give me a hint as to what I need to change and I can come up here and fix that. And this will give you hint about things that aren't errors as well. So for example, if I go down here uh, into my greet function and I just make a variable that I never use. So I'll create a test variable and just set it to uh, the string of test. So if I run that, then after a second, I'm gonna get a green underline here and that is for a warning. If I look at that warning, then it says unused variable test. So usually if you have an unused variable, then that uh, might be a mistake. So usually we don't want those. So with that pointed out, I'm just gonna get rid of that to clean up the code and there we go. Okay, so now let me show you an extension that I like to use that makes running Python code a bit easier. So, so far we've been right clicking and selecting run code in terminal every time we wanna run our Python code. But I'm not the biggest fan of that. Uh, I'd rather have an easy keyboard shortcut that does this for us. And also, I don't like how much output the terminal shows. Uh, so the extension that we're gonna use here is called Code Runner. So I'm gonna come down to our extensions and I'm going to clear our current search and I'm gonna type in code runner. So when I search for that, we can see the top result here uh, is code runner. So I'm going to install this. Now, anytime you have an extension, uh, if we scroll down here, let me, I don't know if I can make this bigger or not. Uh, it doesn't look like I can, I'm uh, zoomed in a little far here. But if I scroll down, then we can look at all the documentation that we have here and it'll show you uh, you know, different configurations. So if we want to change our path for a specific um, language, then we can come in here and these are the settings that we can change here. And it also gives us some customized parameters here. So within our path, we could also put custom parameters as in, you know, we can use the Python path that VS Code is using, uh, the full file name to the code that we're trying to run. And I'll take a look at this in just a second uh, whenever I change some of my settings. But with this installed, uh, we'll now see a run button in the top right of our editor here. Uh, now there are a few other changes that I'd like to make uh, to the settings of this extension, but let's see what this does uh, just right out of the box with this current Python script. So if I run this, then we should get some output here. Okay, so this might look like it worked, but there's one key difference here. Look at this right here. So it says that we're using Python 3.7 and that we got our status code of 200, but the Python interpreter that it's using is the default interpreter for uh, my system. So this is the global version of Python. And I do have requests installed in that global version of Python, but if I didn't have requests installed, then that would fail, even though I do have requests installed in my virtual environment. So we wanna set this up to use our virtual environment instead of our global Python. So to see how to do this, we can change our settings. So I'm going to open up my settings here and within our settings, let me make this one panel again. Uh, within our settings here, I'm going to, I'll just put this here at the bottom. Now there are a couple of settings that I'm gonna change here. Uh, now I looked up what settings I'm gonna change before I started the video, and I have those written down here in front of me. But if you wanna change these to something different, then you can just search through and find these settings yourself and change them to whatever you'd like. So the first setting I'm gonna change here is gonna be code dash runner dot executor map. And this is going to be a dictionary uh, of values here. Uh, so, or a key value pairs here. So when we run Python files, I want this to use uh, the current Python path that VS Code is using. I wanna run that with a dash U, which is a buffering option. I wouldn't worry too much about that. And now I also want to uh, run the full file name and that'll give us the full path to the file that we're trying to run. Uh, now, again, if you don't know where I got these, then you just have to read the extension documentation because that was in here where uh, I scrolled all the way down to their configuration and these are the customized parameters here. So that's where I found the Python path, uh, the full file name and things like that. So now I will close that down, go back to our settings here. 
Now, there are a couple of other things that I want to change here. Um, now, you don't have to make these changes, but this is my preferred uh, settings. So I can do a code runner. And again, I can hit control space to make this uh, autocomplete for me. And I want to change this clear previous output. I want to change that to true because I don't like a lot of previous uh, runs of my script uh, taking up all of my screen. Okay, and now the last thing that I'm going to change here is code runner dot show execution message. Uh, that is true by default. Uh, I want to set this equal to false. Uh, I don't know about you all, but I don't like uh, a lot of output whenever I run certain things. I only uh, want the things that I'm printing out from Python. So what this will get rid of here is this is the execution message where it says running and it gives you the Python that it's running and the uh, file path there. And also it'll say done with exit code zero. None of that's going to show up now. Now it's only going to give us the output from our what we've printed out within our scripts. So if I save those settings, which I did, and now I rerun this Python script, then we can see that it cleared the previous output. And now it doesn't have those execution messages. It only prints out the things we wanted it to print out. So we're using the correct version of Python here. Uh, we can see that now we are using our virtual environment. So that's good. And now uh, we also get a 200 for our status code. So it is using the request library there. So that's great as well. Now, I also told you that we had a keyboard shortcut here. Uh, if I right click, then we can see here at the top, uh, it, we have an option now to run code. And that's what happens whenever we click this run button here at the top. But it tells us that the keyboard shortcut is control alt N. And I'm sure that you can change that keyboard shortcut as well. But if I press control alt N, then we can see that it runs that code as well. Okay. Now, one thing about sublime text, uh, you know, I usually use sublime text for these videos. One thing about sublime text was that people would always ask me how to do input within Sublime. And it was actually hard to do within Sublime. And I would always just recommend against it. I would just recommend instead using the terminal. So to write your script within Sublime and then use the terminal. Uh, now within VS Code, uh, if we want to use input, then it's kind of the same process, but now we have a terminal built in. So I'm going to just get rid of my code here, everything except the imports. And now I'm just going to use an input. So I'm going to say name is equal to input. And for the input, I'm just going to say uh, your name, oh, your name, question mark. And now I will print out a greeting. So I'll just say uh, hello and then print out the name. So I will save that. Uh, now, we won't be able to run this using our code runner that we just installed because that output there is read only. And that was our problem with Sublime Text too. But within VS Code, we can simply do what we did earlier by right clicking and just clicking on run current, uh, run Python file in terminal. So if I do that, then we can see that it pops up here asking us for our name. So I'll just put in Corey and we can see that our program works just fine. So that is how I do that within uh, VS Code. Just a little side note there. Okay, so now I'm going to undo those changes there and get back to what we had before. Okay, so now let's look at the built-in Git integration within VS Code. So let's say that I wanted to track this project with Git and upload it to GitHub. So to track our current project with Git, uh, we can simply click on the source control tab over here in our activity bar. And right now we're not tracking this project with Git. So uh, I could do all of this within the terminal, but we can also just do this here within the user interface as well. So to track this project, I can just click on this Git symbol here beside source control. If I hover over that, it says initialize repository. So I'm gonna click on that and then it's going to ask me what project I want to track. So I'm just going to click on my project, the one that I've been working in. So once we do that, it's going to uh, now put in all of the files here that are untracked. Now, it looks like we have a lot. It says there are over 3,000. But most of these are from our virtual environment. And we usually don't want to even track our virtual environment. So to ignore our, that directory, we just need to create a .gitignore file and add that uh, to what we're tracking with Git. 
So within my folder here, I'm going to click on this uh, icon here beside my project directory that is add new file. And I want to add one that is called dot get ignore. So I will create that within there. I want to ignore venv, the venv directory. And I'm also going to ignore this dot vs code directory as well, because usually you don't want to commit uh, personal settings like that. So now this gives us a visual indicator over here that these are green and has a U over here for untracked. Uh, so we're only going to try to commit two files now, or I only try to stage two files now. And we can see that VS Code and VNV are no longer highlighted. Now you might notice here that it doesn't actually show us the .git directory either that got created when we initialized our directory. So VS Code filters out what files are seen by default and ones that you normally don't want to see are just filtered out. So normally there's no reason to go into certain folders or directories, for example, .git. You never really want to go in there and mess around with it. So it's just nice to filter it out so that you don't have to see it in your way. Now, if you want to change what is shown and what's hidden, then you can change that in your settings, but I think that their defaults are pretty good. So now let's go back to the Git section. So we'll click on this source control tab in our activity bar. And now we can see that it only wants to stage uh, the Git ignore file and our Python script. So to stage those, we could hover over them and just click on the plus icon beside each file. So if I do that with Git ignore, we can see that that got staged or if we wanted to stage all of the changes, then we can just click the extra options up here at the top right. And then if I scroll down here, I can go to stage all changes. So if I do that, then we can see that now our script.py is staged as well. So now to commit, we can just click on this check mark here to commit. And now it's going to ask us for a commit message. So I'm just going to say this is an initial commit, hit enter, and now it's giving me a pop-up here that I haven't configured my username or email within Git yet. Uh, so the reason is because I uninstalled Git and reinstalled it uh, before this video. So you might run into that as well. So in order to set my name and my email, I'm going to want to uh, run some Git commands here within the terminal. Now I use Git bash. Uh, so if you want to use Git bash as well, then we can set up what terminal we want to use uh, within VS Code. So to do that, I'm going to open up my browser again here, and I have this integrated terminal section of their documentation opened up here. And you can change what terminal you use uh, by changing this command here, terminal.integrated.shell.windows. Uh, so we can see here that they have the default location to git bash if you want to use git bash. We can also use the command prompt by default, which we have been using. Uh, we can use PowerShell uh, or bash on Ubuntu. Uh, so I'm going to use git bash here. So I will just copy this entire setting here. And I've already double checked. This actually is where uh, git bash was installed on my machine. If you installed it somewhere else, then you'll want to use that exact location. But that's where it is on my machine. So uh, we can open this back up go to our settings. So I'm going to open up my global settings here. Let me close down that terminal right now. And down here at the bottom, I am just going to uh, paste this in to use git bash as the integrated uh, terminal. So I'm going to save that. And now let me close down the terminal that we had before and now open that back up. And now we should be using git bash instead. And we can see that it still activates that virtual environment. Uh, now my text is a little large here, so I'm running onto a new line, uh, but it's large enough just so you all can see. But normally this would all be on one line here. Um, so let me uh, clear this out just by running clear there. And now I can run those git configurations that I need. So I'll just do a git config dash dash global. Some of you might not need to do this. You might already have uh, everything for your git set up, but just in case you don't, uh, then this is how you can make some of these uh, setting changes. So I will change the the name and I will also change the email. So my email is Corey M. Schaefer at gmail.com. And now if we do a git config dash dash list, then it gives us a lot of different options here, uh, but we can see our name and email there. Okay, so now let me close that down. Let me try to commit these again with those changes in place. So initial 
commit. And now it says that those were committed and now we don't have any changes. So now that we have our code committed to Git, now it'll only show us the changes that we've made since the last commit. So I'm gonna change or close down my git ignore file here. Uh, so if I go to my script and I, let me take out some of this stuff here. Uh, so I am going to take out all of my imports except the request code. I'm going to take out the version and the executable, take out the greeting, and I'm just gonna leave uh, the request code there. Now I'm also going to, let's see, I will also print uh, the value of r dot okay. That'll just tell us if we got a good response or not. So now, if I go back to the source control section here and look at this, if I click on my script, then it's gonna show us a diff. Okay, so within the diff here, we have the version of the code that we last committed over here on the left. And now, this is our new code over here on the right. So the red is saying, hey, you removed all of this stuff here. That's what was last committed, it's now gone. And the green over here is saying, oh, and this is what was added. This, we didn't have this here before, and now we do. So if that diff looks good, then you can simply stage your changes. I'm gonna close down the diff here. So we stage the changes here, it says that it's modified. Now I can commit that, and as a commit message here, I'll just say, uh, removed some code. I know I added some too, but that's fine. Okay, so now we have committed those changes. So now let's say that we wanted to commit this code up to GitHub. So this is pretty simple to do as well. So all we have to do is create a repository within the browser, and then we can set that up to push to that repository. So I've got my GitHub open here in the browser. So let me refresh this to make sure I am still logged in, and it looks like I am, so that's good. So now I'm going to create a new repository, and I'm just gonna call this sample-repo. So now, uh, let's see, I'll just have it as public, no description or anything like that. You can add that stuff in if you'd like, obviously. Uh, so once we create this repository, then it's going to open up this quick setup page here and give us some commands. So if we were creating a new repository from scratch, then we would use these commands here. Uh, but we are actually going to be pushing an existing repository. So these are the commands that we need here. So I just want this git remote add origin command. So I'm going to copy that. And that's what is going to uh, connect our local repository to the repository on GitHub. So back within VS code here, I'm going to open up my terminal and we are now using git bash like I said before. So I'll clear the screen and I'm just going to paste that in, that command that we got from GitHub. So I'll run that and <clears throat> now we have that origin. So now I'll close our terminal, go back to our source control and within our source control tab, I can simply uh, click here with the extra options and I'm going to select this command here, push to. And when I click push to, uh, it says, well, where do we wanna push this? We have this thing called origin here at this URL, and that is uh, what got added when we ran that command that Git gave us, or that GitHub gave us. So if I run that, then it's gonna push that up to GitHub. Now it's asking me to log in here. Uh, so let me log in really quick with my username and password. It's been a while since I've logged in, so hopefully that's the right password. Uh, okay, and now it's asking if we'd like to periodically run git fetch. Uh, we can select whatever we want there. I'll just select yes. So now it looks like that worked. So let me go back to the browser. Oops, that's the wrong one. Let me go back to the browser here and look in this sample repo and we can see that we got our git ignore file and our script so that is what we pushed up from vs code so that seems to be working well so that's nice so that's how you can work with git and github in vs code now if you'd like to learn more about git then i do have a detailed video on that and i'll leave a link to that uh, video in the description section below if anyone is more interested in learning uh, all of the fundamentals with git uh, now, I also plan on doing a video on GitHub in the near future, uh, but I haven't got around to doing that just yet. But for this video, I just wanted to cover the basics of their Git integration and uh, just show you how to get started with that. 
Okay, so now let's look at how to do some basic debugging within VS Code. So this is a really nice feature that doesn't come built in with some of the other minimalist editors out there. So we're back here in our script, and to put in a breakpoint, we can simply come over here into the gutter, and we can, where it has this red line here, if I click that, then we have now added a breakpoint into our script. So now, if we want to debug this code, we can come into the debug tab over here in our activity bar. And now, let me make this a little bit larger here. We can see that it says we don't currently have any configurations, but if I click the little gear icon here, then we can see some different configurations. So we have Python file, uh, we have module Django Flask, so you can set up these configurations to where it'll run you know, your main Flask app from there, and you can also specify ports and stuff like that. For this video, we're just gonna look at debugging a basic Python file. So I'm gonna select Python file, it's going to show us the launch configuration that we just created. So I'm going to exit that. And now we have a configuration set here for Python current file. So if I run that just by clicking this green arrow here that says start debugging. Now this is going to start a debugger here. What this is going to do is it's going to run our code and it's going to stop at our breakpoints. So now we can interact with our code as it is at the moment of that breakpoint. So if we look here in the top left, then it'll show you all of the current local values in our code. And we can drill down into these as well. So we can see that we have this R variable here. I can drill down into that to see exactly what all of this is. So we can see the headers, the encoding, the cookies, things like that. So we can keep drilling down as far as we want. Uh, so right underneath that local variables, we also have a watch section. So we could, if we wanted to watch a specific variable, uh, then we could just click the plus sign there and now specify what we want to watch. So let's say that I want to watch R dot status code. So we can see that that is equal to 200. Uh, so that is the current value uh, of where we are in that breakpoint. Now, if we were watching a value that was in a loop or something like that, then we'd actually be able to see that increment each time through the loop if we had a breakpoint within that loop. Now, if you want something more interactive, then we can also use, let me make this a little smaller over here, we can also use the debug console and use this to inspect anything we'd like. So I'm gonna click on our additional views here, click on debug console, and within the debug console, we can just use this like an interactive Python prompt. So if I wanted to see the value of R dot OK, then I could just run that. And we can see that it gives us this feedback of exactly what these values are equal to at this point in the script. So that's extremely useful. And you can just look at anything you'd like. So if I want to see R dot URL, then we can see the URL that we uh, requested there. So being able to jump into the code at a specific location and see the current values uh, can be extremely useful in a lot of situations. So uh, debugging like this is so much better than dropping down a lot of print statements or log statements all throughout your code and just running your code over and over. Uh, this usually allows you to keep your code clean and see all of this information that you need in order to make sure that your code is working how you expect. Uh, and if not, then you know hopefully it'll at least help you out enough to where you can uh, find out where to go fix your code. So once you're at a breakpoint, we can see that we have several options here, and those are all listed right here. So we can uh, continue on by clicking this button here. We can step over a current breakpoint. We can step into the code further. Uh, we can step out of the code, uh, or we can restart or stop our debug session here. Uh, so I'm just going to uh, continue on. And when I continue on, it's just going to continue on with our script. And since we don't have any more breakpoints, it's just going to finish that. So now if we want to remove a debug breakpoint, then we can just click on it over here in the gutter and now it's gone. Okay, so that is a look at debugging. Okay, so the last thing that we're gonna take a look at in this video 
is the unit testing support that they have built in to VS Code. And I'm really loving their attention to detail and how they covered so many different aspects of helping us manage our code as easily as possible. So having the built-in support for all this stuff is definitely a nice addition that you're not gonna find in most other editors. So to show some unit testing, I'm gonna close down my current project and I'm going to open up a, a different project uh, that has some sample unit tests. So I'm going to close both of these down. It looks like I have two of them open up here. So I'm gonna close both of these down. Oops, actually this is my uh, setup there. So I'm just going to close that. So now let me open up my terminal and within my terminal, I'm gonna to navigate to my desktop and within my desktop, uh, let's see if I can open up VS Code here from my terminal. So the command that we can use is code. So if I say code and then my directory, and this directory is called unit testing demo. If I run that, then it looks like that uh, works. It opens up that uh, directory within VS Code. Now I've had times where it doesn't install that code command to my path. Uh, so if it doesn't, uh, and it says, you know, code command not recognized or something like that. You can always install that by opening up, up your command palette. So uh, control shift P. And if I type in shell, uh, then we should, let's see, or is it code? Maybe it's not coming up because it is installed, but there is something if we type in shell or code or something like that, then it'll say, uh, you know, install the code command onto your path. But I'm not seeing it here now, but that's okay because we already have uh, that code command installed. So now we have a, a project here with some sample unit tests. So let me open up these unit tests here and let's see. Now this is giving me a PyLinter not installed error again. Now the reason that it's doing this is because we installed PyLint when, after we activated our virtual environment last time. So I'm just going to say to install that for our default Python as well so that we stop seeing those pop-ups. Okay, so now let me open up both of these unit tests here. Okay, so now that we have some unit tests available here, uh, let's run, uh, open up our command palette. And now let's type in discover tests. And when we run discover tests, then it's gonna come up with this pop-up here that says enable and configure test framework. So I'm gonna click on that. And now it's gonna ask us what unit testing framework we wanna use. PyTest is very popular. I'm using unit test in this example, but you can select whatever it is that you're using. Uh, now we're gonna choose the directory that contains our unit test, and that is our current directory, so our root directory. And now the pattern to identify the test. So there are a bunch of different naming patterns here. The one that we are using is test underscore and then asterisk, the wildcard uh, name of the file. So I'm gonna use that. And now it should discover our unit tests for us. And after it discovered that unit test, we can see that we had these pop-ups here within uh, VS Code that says run test, debug test right here within the editor. So we can run a single test at a time if we want. So if I was to run, check this test add uh, test here, if I run that, then we can see that that got a check mark, uh, but none of these other ones actually ran. And down here at the bottom left, we can see that it says one test passed. Now, if we run, want to run our entire test class, then we have that option here as well too. So I can go click on run test class, and now we can see down here at the bottom, it says four tests have passed. So let me change one of these assertions to where one of these tests will fail so that we can see what that looks like. So I'm gonna say 10 plus five is equal to 10, which obviously isn't right. So uh, now this is also asking us if we want to use uh, our formatter as well. So I'll go ahead and install that also. So now if we run our tests here, then now we can see it says three tests pass, uh, one test failed. So if I click on this status down here in the bottom, then it'll ask us what we wanna do. So we can run all of the tests again. We can uh, simply just run the failed test, which is a nice feature as well. Or we can view the test output. If I look at the test output here, then we can see it ran four tests, one of them failed, 
uh, and it failed because of an assertion error that 15 is not equal to 10 and that it failed on line 8. So it shows us exactly where that error occurred. So then we can come in here and either fix our code or fix our test, whichever one was broken. And then we can rerun all of those again and we can see that, oops, and it looks like I didn't save that. So if I save that and rerun those again, then we can see that all of those passed. Now, lastly, it actually just opened this up automatically just now. Uh, but lastly, we get an additional tab over here in our activity bar, and this is a testing tab. So when I click on this, this gives us a nice uh, visual indicator of if our tests are passing or failing. So again, let me change this to where it is failing and save that. And now we can also run these tests uh, within this uh, testing tab over here as well. So if I want to rerun our entire test calc class, I can click on that. We can see that that failed because this single test here failed. All of these seem to do well. Uh, so we can uh, look at the output and everything like that, just like we did before. But if I change that back, go back here and rerun all of my tests, then we can see that now those are passing. Let me run that entire class. And we can see that all those are passing now. So I think that this is an awesome interface for seeing all of our tests in one place. And if something is failing, then we can come in here and just rerun a specific test by running it individually instead of rerunning our entire test suite. So I think it's an awesome feature that's built right into VS Code. Now, there's one last thing that I want to show you in this video, and it's only going to take one second. So I have some other preferred settings that I haven't shown in this video, and most of them are settings for changing how the editor looks in full screen Zen mode and will allow me to run code without too much other stuff getting in the way. And I want to show you these settings so that you can see exactly how I'm going to have my VS Code set up if you see me using this editor in future videos, uh, because I get a lot of questions about exactly how I set up my editors. So I have those settings pulled up open here in my browser. So let me open those and pull these settings up. So these are available on my GitHub, and I have these open in the raw version here right now. So I'm just going to uh, copy these. Now these are actually my Mac settings, so I don't have uh, you know, the uh, Windows integrated terminal settings in here and things like that. Uh, but most of these are the same. But for now, uh, I can just use these because it will show you the Zen mode changes that I'm going to show you here in a second. So now I'm going to open up my settings and I'm just going to paste all of those in that I got from GitHub. So I'll save that and run it. And we can see that this is a little smaller text here because these are the settings that I actually use on my machine, so it's not super zoomed in. Uh, let me take these up a bit. Uh, let's see, so I think maybe 20 font would look better. So yeah, I think that'll look good for the rest of this video. So I can close those settings. And like I said, the settings that we just added in there, most of them are the same from the ones that we saw earlier in the video, but the new ones just changed how the editor looks in Zen mode. And Zen mode is just their distraction-free mode that allows you to focus more on your code and your output and hides a lot of the other menus and things that you might find distracting. So let me open up Zen mode. So I'll open up my command palette and just type in Zen and open up Zen mode here. And we can see how I have this set up. Uh, it you know, takes away our activity bar, uh, the blue bar down here at the bottom. So it's just a lot more clean and the uh, nothing is distracting us from the code itself. And we can still run code by just clicking up here and clicking run code. Now it's telling me it can't find the uh, specified path. And the reason is because like I was saying, these are my Mac settings. So the path that I have set up uh, for my Mac is this is more of a Linux style path. It's this user local bin uh, Python here. Uh, so we would have to go into our settings and set that equal to what we set it to before when we used uh, Python 3 from our Windows system. But basically I wanted to show this because if I do use v VS Code in future tutorials, then this is likely how you're gonna see me using it. Uh, the code will look a lot like this. Um, so the editor that I normally use for videos is Sublime Text, and I really like Sublime Text's uh, minimalist look so that we can just focus on the code and the output. But with Zen Mode set up like I have it set up here, uh, we have a very similar nice minimalist setup here in VS Code as well. So you might see me using this if I completely make the switch over to VS Code.
Okay, so that's all I wanted to cover for the Python features that I wanted to show you in VS Code. Now, there's a ton more to learn about VS Code itself, uh, but I might save that for another video if anyone is interested. Uh, most of the additional things that I like to cover is just how to use some of the editor features, like multiple cursors and some of my favorite keyboard shortcuts. Uh, but if you'd like to see some of these keyboard shortcuts for yourself, then they make it easy to learn these. Uh, so we can just open up the command palette and search for... Uh, keyboard, whoops, spelled that wrong, keyboard shortcuts. And the first result here is keyboard shortcut references. And this will open up a web page and we can zoom in here. And we can see that this shows us basically how to do anything within VS Code that we'd want to do. Uh, so we have all of the multi-cursor selection here, uh, file management, search and replace, things like that. So that is a nice reference there if you would like to learn any of those keyboard shortcuts. Okay, so I think that is going to do it for this video. I hope you all found this video helpful, uh, especially if you're trying to switch over to VS Code for your Python development. So personally, I think they really knocked it out of the park with this editor. Uh, as you saw, they have so many features that are built in, and the features that aren't built in are really easy to get installed and configured. Uh, it's not like other editors where you have to search through, you know, 10 to 20 different packages and find the one that you like the most and then use that one and make sure that it stays supported and things like that. It's not like that with VS Code. It makes recommendations to uh, install what it suggests and then it just makes it easy to get those up and running. But if anyone has any questions about what we covered in this video, then feel free to ask in the comment section below and I'll do my best to answer those. And if you enjoy these tutorials and would like to support them, then there are several ways you can do that. The easiest way is to simply like the video and give it a thumbs up. And also it's a huge help to share these videos with anyone who you think would find them useful. And if you have the means, you can contribute through Patreon and there's a link to that page in the description section below. Be sure to subscribe for future videos and thank you all for watching.